Good, okay. Uh, so in this session, uh, we'll talk about Xgene 3, which is the third generation 64-bit ARM server developed by Applied Micro. So my name is Kumar Shankaran. I'm, a, I'm the Associate Vice President of Software and Platform Engineering for Applied Micro. And in this session, I'll be joined by Jack Bolaria from the Linley Group. In terms of an agenda, so uh, we'll have Jack come in here first to talk about the ARM server processor opportunity. And that'll be for a few minutes here for the first half of the session. And for the second half of the session, I'll come back here again. And we'll be talking about some, th some things about the Xgene deployments, how they are deployed today amongst the multiple generations. So we have three, three generations today, two in production and one sampling. So we'll talk about Xgene 1, Xgene 2, and Xgene 3 and also talk about the value proposition that Xgene brings as a family. So with that, I'll hand it over to Jack, uh, who is the principal analyst from the Lindy Group. All right. Thanks, Kumar. Um, so hopefully everybody can hear me. My voice is a little so hoarse from the uh, end of a cold. But uh, the Lindy Group, we do a lot of research on various fields, including servers, and we've been following uh, ARM processors and x86 processors for more than a decade. Um, so I'm going to give you, a, in this few slides, a little highlight on some of the things we're doing. Um, so basically, it shouldn't be a surprise to anybody that Intel dominates this space currently with more than 99% of the market share. And Intel has established this position on various things that it's done better than anybody else. One is, is the industry leader in process technology, and as a result, it's been able to develop processors that have higher performance, uh, have the best performance per watt than anybody else in the industry. And as a result, um, it kind of has that established market share. Uh, the, some things are changing, as you've already seen today, but things are changing which are fundamentally gonna change the landscape as you look forward. One of those things is the process technology. So process technology has been going from one node to the next every couple of years. So that's going to allow Intel to develop products which are 20, 30% performance improvement with each node, and then come up with a new architecture alternate years in this TikTok model of offering 20% kind of improvement every year. But one of the things that's happened with 14 nanometers is that the process technology node, instead of two years, has begun to be three years. So as of 10 nanometers, it's going to be three years plus. And as you start going further out in time, it's going to become four years. And by the time we get to five nanometers, it's going to become five, five years. So that is reduced to slow down the rate of um, process performance improvements that you can expect. And the second thing that's happened is that everything has been very centralized on the processor. So all of the... Um, um, innovation technologies come through the processor, and that's kind of created bottlenecks within the platform. And some of those bottlenecks are in the memory, where the memory technology is bottlenecked up, or storage technology. And in the, on the networking side, um, and some of the other specific workloads, you already begin to see um, innovation in the sense of intelligent NICs. If you saw earlier presentations, you might have heard about intelligent NICs from Mellanox. Uh, and then you're also seeing acceleration, where uh, Microsoft talks about acceleration with GPUs. Again, this is basically trying to bring the platform innovation up. Um, so Intel is promoting through, uh, gen, uh, sorry, 3D cross points. Other people are looking at intelligent memory with packetized memory interfaces such as Gen Z. So um, moving on, some of the things that we're seeing in terms of server market, this slide shows you the um, market in terms of processors, right? Okay, I guess I don't really see it's too bright. But anyway, the, basically the market continues to grow. So the key takeaways here are that the public cloud, which is the red segments you see, is a growing segment of the server processor market. The segment which is not growing is the enterprise segment, which is the blue segment at the bottom. Storage is another growth area, and a new area that a lot of people are spending more time and energy in is networking, as kind of telcos start looking at software-defined networking, network function virtualizations, and that becomes another area that will begin to see growth in that market. Um, the other thing that we're seeing here is because of competition coming on board, some of the ARM guys coming, uh, the prices which have been increasing for prices of processors are beginning to flatten out. 
Um, so there is definitely a demand now for an alternative because Intel is the primary player here. Um, and we think with uh, the ARM folks coming in, the type of applications that they'll be able to target are scale-out applications. So we've kind of looked at within the public cloud, within the red dots here, how big that scale-out market is going to be that it, the ARM guys can target. Not to say that, that they'll get that. And we estimate by 2020 that market's about two and a half billion dollars. And with the news that you saw today, with Microsoft opening up a Windows platform as another area that the ARM folks can target, that market could actually even get bigger still in the 2020 time frame. So here we show uh, where the ARM processors stack up relative to Xeon processors in the market. And we've kind of looked at here, what you see on the horizontal axis is the overall performance of a processor. And what you see on the vertical axis is the performance per thread. Right. And so the here you, you're seeing in the first generation, which are the products out here, with like the X-Gene 1 and the X-Gene 2, a fairly low performance compared to a Xeon product, and therefore they have limited market. And then we're seeing as the second generation of products come, the performance improves. The other big thing here in this space, which makes it really interesting and exciting, is it takes a couple of years before you can actually get the ecosystem in place. So even if you have a great processor, it's only useful once you have an ecosystem in place. So with the ARM guys, the Applied Micro, for example, at X-Gene 3 several years, X-Gene 1, sorry, several years ago, Cavium had a Thunder X several years ago. It's taken them a couple of years to develop this ecosystem. And now to the point we have, we didn't have this a couple of years ago, we've got commercial distributions of Linux operating systems. We've got compilers that support those operating systems. And then we've got boot up codes, BIOS codes, UFV that is up for those platforms. So basically the infrastructure is in place to allow some of the volume to actually start happening, which wasn't necessarily in place before. Uh, the second thing that I mentioned is the performance level has increased. As you see, the first generation was more like where my arrow, red line is here. The second generation or the second wave of things has got a huge improvement. And that's going to exemplify it here by the X-Gene 3 that uh, Kamar will talk about, where the performance has improved from having four times the number of cores, 25% faster than they were before, having double the number of memory controllers. So you've got 2.8 times the memory bandwidth because the frequency also went up. The capacity has gone up. The PCI rates have gone up. So basically, you've got this thing where the second wave of these, which basically are represented by X-Gene 3 and Thunder X2 that you can hear about from the Cavium folks, has improved significantly to make the whole platform attractive. We've got a couple of minutes, I'm told. So anyway, um, and then with uh, Qualcomm, Centric, and uh, the, the Thunder X platform, which was announced this morning with Microsoft, that kind of shows you that there is a diverse enough system that we've now got critical mass that you're going to see actually uh, um, some of the server processor volume actually moving to these ARM processors. So th this here, I didn't get the detail. It shows you what Intel is shipping today in this platform, which is a Broadwell platform, Xeon E5s. But what the ARM community is going to compete against really a Skylake platform which um, is actually, I think, maybe shown in some of the, the, in some of the boots here. You'll see a Skylake boxes. And with Skylake, we expect about a 30% performance improvement. So when we look at a Skylake platform relative to where X-Gene 3 is, we're going to see, because of the level of integration that X-Gene 3 has, when you account for the extra memory controllers and the PCI ports, the performance per watt is very similar between an X-Gene 3 as a mainstream Xeon E5. And again, I say mainstream because Xeons, they go range all the way up from a few hundred dollars to several thousand dollars. So Intel will continue to have the highest performance, um, which they're selling at the high end, which is not really an area that most of the ARM guys will be able to compete against. Um, so just wrapping up on my final slide, the first wave of products, if you look at workloads, and I think this is some of the things that Microsoft was talking about, the workload span, if you look at performance on one side, memory and I.O. bandwidth on one side, and power on the other side, so in this multi-dimensional scheme, these workloads kind of map all over the place, depending upon whether it's high-performance computing, whether it's search, or whether you're looking at storage or web server. So the first wave, first generation of uh, products from the ARM community was pretty much located a very small area here 
which is kind of on the storage side of things. And then they expanded in the second generation, like the XGene type of product, scale out. And with the performance that we're going to see from XGene 3 and the second generation of the products that you're seeing from some of the folks here is actually going to start moving the performance higher in, in this curve, right? So um, they're going to go really in the mainstream of a server platform, not necessarily all the way at the highest end of these server platforms. So that meaning that the landscape in the next two, three years is going to be drastically different than where we are today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kumar, who can talk to you about his product line. Okay. Thanks, Jag. Uh, so what uh, we'll cover in the next few minutes here is, uh, as you heard from Jag, he talked about the technology as a whole and where how XGene 3 benefits from this technology, right? So in the next few slides here, we'll talk about the current XGene deployments with both uh, the first version, first generation, second generation, and the third generation, which is XGene 3 that you saw here. So uh, rewinding, uh, going back a few, a little bit. So this is the first generation platform that was announced by HP, HPE, HP Enterprise. And this is the HP 3200 store virtual enterprise storage platform. So we launched this towards the end of last year. And this is available in production today. This uses the first generation XGene 1 and is deployed in production today. Some of the features on the left side here, you see uh, entry level enterprise storage market segment, uh, what's called five nines reliability, which is very critical for a storage server, which is 99.999% reliability. And then other features like RAID and dual controller redundancy, which is standard, right? And then lastly, it uses the HPE store virtual operating system, which has been out there for several years. Now, why did HP choose this? the value proposition is sort of on the right side of the screen. So you can kind of see the comparison between the 3200 platform and the 4330 platform that is also available in production today. So form factor wise, both are two use. Uh, the raw capacity is equivalent at 14.4 terabytes of storage. But the important thing is on the 4330, only 7.2 terabytes is addressable at any point in time. Performance pretty similar. It's about 60,000 IOPS from a chassis perspective. And then the street price is about $14,000 for the ARM platform versus $33,000. So in other words, the takeaway here is it's 100% more usable capacity at equivalent performance and less than half the cost, right? So that was the takeaway from this XGene 1 deployment that HP did with the enterprise storage. Moving to second generation, XGene 2. So this, we have a production deployment right now in the Redis Memcached server. So this is an in-memory database workload. And uh, so again, a similar table of comparison between why the customer chose XGene 2. On the left, you see uh, the existing server that was deployed. And on the right is the similar server with XGene 2. So in terms of uh, performance, you kind of see it's a similar number, about roughly 450K ops. The power is about 85 watt versus 35 watt, which is significantly lower. And the cost wise, it was 40% lower. So the takeaway from this, sli this slide was, it's similar performance at 60% lower power and 40% lower cost. Now, how that translated to the customer's rack level deployment was it gave them about a 30% TCO savings at a rack level. So that made them make the shift from like a traditional platform to like an XGene 2 based ARM64 design. Now, finally, moving to XGene 3. So uh, we have talked about XGene 3 a lot. We launched this about over a year back. And so in terms of a high level features, so it's a 32-core platform, 64-bit ARM, and uh, has the same architecture as XGene 1 and XGene 2 fundamentally. So there's 32 kilobyte of iCache and 32 kilobyte of dcache per core, a shared 256 kilobyte of L2 cache per pair, of course. Memory side, 32 megabyte of globally accessible L3. The important distinction that you would see in this is eight memory channels. So there are 16 DIMMs per socket, which lets us give about a one terabyte of socket with the available DIMMs today. Moving to system resources, GIC v3, full I.O. virtualization for running virtualized applications is standard, and also supports enterprise class RAS, which is reliability and serviceability. Moving to connectivity, 42 lanes of PCI Gen 3 for vast expansion, multiple eight controllers, the whole bunch of SATA ports, USB ports, and a LOM, which is RGMI for one gigabit LAN on motherboard. Functionality-wise, this is the first device where we are bringing in EL3, exception level three in ARM terminology which lets us have features like uh, secure memory, secure boot, and trust zones. And uh, again, advanced power management with ACPI. On the performance, 
approximately about a 550 second rate per socket at a 110 to about 125 watt TDP. So that's, the, that's where the sweet spot for us is. So moving on, how does this uh, compete right, in terms of workloads? So we see uh, the in-memory database workloads is a very good fit for XGN3. So Cassandra being one of them. So Cassandra is an in-memory workload. The data gets fetched from a storage device into memory. So a large memory footprint is an important requirement for this workload. So similar table here comparing XGN3 versus XGN2 that you saw before. And uh, in terms of uh, Cassandra, it's about 5x greater performance versus XGN2. So with a similar workload, we get about 5x greater performance from going from XGN2 to XGN3. So that's the takeaway from this slide. And finally, to conclude, so uh, bottom line, what we wanted to take uh, you guys to take away from this, uh, this uh, speech here is, so both XGN1 and XGN2 are in production. There are servers in the booth. We, are, we have a booth here. XGN3 sampling now. We feel that the XGN3 is a very good fit for uh, the target mainstream workloads that are run by the enterprise data center guys today. So as you heard from JAG, it's, it's a very good fit for things like machine learning, uh, in-memory databases, web servers, and it really competes with the, the Skylake Xeon family of products. So we have a booth here, and uh, I'll be there in the booth. It's C19, it's in the corner. Come by if you have any more questions. We can have a more detailed discussion. We are running, showing live demos of Cassandra at the booth. So you'll see a real, uh, you can experience the technology live. And so I'll be there on both the days during the expo hours today and tomorrow. So in terms of our prepared presentation, that's all we had. Thank you.